Parents, just so that you know, we will be bringing the children back up at the end of our service to witness and to see the baptisms that will take place at the end of our service. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, please turn with me in them to the Gospel of Mark chapter 7. For those of you that uh, maybe aren't here with us on a regular basis, I know we have a number of visiting people this morning. Just so you know, we have been working our way since September with various breaks in there for Christmas and other things, but we've been working ourselves through the Gospel of Mark. And we find ourselves right now in Mark chapter 7, verse 24. And Jesus has been teaching and preaching. He's been healing. He's been casting out demons. He's been engaging, going toe-to-toe with the Pharisees and engaging in theological debate. And where we are right now is uh, a situation that comes up after Jesus has been talking with the Pharisees. This is the Word of God, Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse 24, and we will read down to the end of verse 30. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Let's just take a few moments and go before the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we ask you this morning to help us. We confess that throughout this week, we have all trusted in ourselves more than we've trusted in you. We've trusted in our own strength, our own intellect, our own abilities, our own finances, our own social positions more than we've trusted in the glorious grace that only you can give. Lord, we confess this sin to you this morning and we would ask that you would help us to depend on you more. We we recognize, Lord, with our minds that we need your help to understand your word and we pray that you would work in us now to open up our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our hearts to obey. We ask for the same for the children downstairs. We thank you for the treasure that these children are, not just to their parents, but to us as a church we pray that you would help us to, to take this responsibility of teaching them very seriously. And we ask for their teachers, that you would give them words of wisdom, help them to explain the gospel in a very clear way so that the children would have no excuse for not hearing the gospel and obeying. We ask you now again to help us as we consider your word. Teach us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I mentioned a few moments ago, the passage that we have before us this morning, this short little passage, this short little interaction that Jesus has with this woman, comes on the heels of uh, an interaction that Jesus had with the Pharisees. If you were here with us last week, you will remember that we looked at a rather lengthy passage of Scripture where Jesus was engaging in dialogue with the Pharisees, particularly over the, the issue of defilement. The Pharisees said that Jesus and his disciples were defiled, were unclean, were unholy because they didn't wash their hands properly. They didn't follow the traditions that the Pharisees had come up with. And Jesus kind of destroyed all of their ideas. He basically took them uh, through the wash, so to speak, and what came out was your ideas, your format, your traditions don't make anybody clean because cleanliness before God, being right before God is not a matter of washing away of external dirt. It's not a format of traditions. What needs to be changed is your heart and you can't change your heart. Only God can. We must receive the grace of God in order to be cleansed, in order to be restored. That is the only way to be made right with God. And then what we see is immediately as he's done discussing this defilement issue, Jesus gets up and leaves. 
We're told that he gets up and he goes to a place that is predominantly inhabited, uh, or he went from a place that was predominantly inhabited by Jewish people, his own people, the people who understand defilement, who understood the, the law. They understood those kind of things because that was their tradition. That was what they were brought up in. And he goes from there and he leaves and goes to a region, the region of Tyre and Sidon. He goes to a place of pagan idolatry. He goes to a place that wasn't just filled with unclean people according to the Jewish law, the land itself was unclean. The land itself was defiled. The land itself and the people were unholy. The place that Jesus goes to was formerly of the tribe of Asher. If you jump all the way back to the Old Testament and you read in Deuteronomy and then the book of Joshua, you will read about the tribal allotments. Who got to go where? Tyre and Sidon was a part of the tribe of Asher. It was part of their allotment. But now it was definitively Gentile territory. A Gentile was, and still is, even today, anybody who is not ethnically Jewish. It's a simple way of just saying there are Jews and everybody else. And that's probably most of us here today. There may be some of us that are ethnically Jewish, but for the vast majority of us here, we will not be descendants from Abraham physically. We will not have our heritage attached to Israel. And this place was filled with people who who knew nothing of God's law, who knew nothing of his ways, and only cared for worshiping their idols. There would have been some Jews in the region There would have been some who were living in this unclean land, perhaps descendants of the tribe of Asher who had kept on to their homeland, but this place has become polluted because of the idolatrous ways. As you move from Joshua into the book of Judges and as you continue reading through the Old Testament, you see that what was once a holy land, what was once the holy place of Israel has been overrun by idolatry slowly through the kings, not just of external kings, but through the kings of the nation of Israel, through the southern tribe and the northern tribe, the tribe of Judah to the south and the tribe of Israel to the north, they allowed pagan idolatry into their kingdom. And this place is polluted because of it. And so part of the question is that we have to ask is why is Jesus here? What is he doing? Why would he go from a place of, of predominantly Jewish people, his own people, the people that he's come to preach to, why would he go from there to a place that is just filled with idolatry that is overwhelmingly anti-God. We're not told why. Mark doesn't give us the reason. Jesus went here because. Mark doesn't do that. Perhaps Jesus is seeking escape from the harassment of the Pharisees. They keep popping up you know, from time to time and they start harassing Jesus and his disciples. Perhaps Jesus is just looking for a break. Maybe he's trying to avoid the attention of Herod, now that people are beginning to think that Jesus might be John the Baptist raised from the dead. We looked at that a few weeks ago and perhaps he's just trying to avoid the eye of Herod. Perhaps he's trying to escape the attention of the crowds. It seems like everywhere that Jesus goes, there's thousands of people that are waiting for him. And he and his disciples have just not had that chance to actually rest, to find that time to be restored back to physical uh, energy. Perhaps he's seeking solitude for the rest and relaxation that is so hard to come by. Whatever his reason for retreating into the Gentile land, whatever his reason for seeking to hide himself from people, we see in the text that his solitude doesn't last very long. Jesus is interrupted. He could not remain hidden, verse 24 says. He couldn't do it. He's interrupted, and what follows is his interaction with this Gentile woman. I've broken this section down, these few short verses down into into four stages, four phases of their interaction with one another. The stages are these. There's the request, the response, the reaction, and the relief. Four phases of Jesus and this woman interacting with one another. The request, the response, the reaction, and the relief. The first stage we see is the request. 
the request, the quest for solitude that Jesus was on is interrupted by this desperate woman with this heartbreaking appeal to Jesus. She comes to Jesus and pleads with him because her little girl is possessed, is haunted by this unclean spirit, by this demon, her little, her little daughter that she loves and cares for just like any good mother would is not right, is not well, and she comes to Jesus begging him to heal. The text says that she has heard of Jesus, and when she heard of him, the region of Tyre was roughly uh, 30 kilometers to the northwest, northwest, I'm backwards to you guys, I'm looking at the map in my own mind, it was roughly 30 kilometers to the northwest of Capernaum, which is where Jesus has his home base. The disciples in Jesus make their, their home base Capernaum, and they will go out and they will minister to the surrounding regions. The region of Tyre is roughly 30 kilometers to the northwest. It's on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And so it's unlikely that this woman has witnessed anything of Jesus herself. It's unlikely because of the distance, because quite frankly, many people, most people didn't travel all that far in that day and age. It's unlikely and doubtful that she has seen any of the miracles of Jesus firsthand that she's heard Jesus' teaching for herself. She's only heard. She's certainly heard of him. News of Jesus spreads fast, even though she hasn't actually witnessed it for herself. She's heard it likely from travelers coming through her region. And this miraculous man, this Jesus that she's heard of, is now here in her region. And she will not pass up this opportunity to go ask him for a miracle of her own. She's heard of Jesus healing Anybody and everybody who comes to him, he heals the sick, he heals the lame, he heals those that are, that have unclean spirits, he casts them out, Jesus, will you not do this for me? She comes to Jesus and she, she prostrates herself before Jesus, she falls down on her face, she falls down at his feet and she begs Jesus, just like Jairus did when he was when he was feeling frantic and when he was desperate and when he was hopeless. We looked at that a number of months ago. But this woman isn't like Jairus. Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue. He was well respected and important in Jewish society. But this woman is everything that Jairus isn't. If there was anyone who is the exact opposite of Jairus, it was this woman. Verse 26 tells us just how different this woman really is. She's a Gentile. She's a pagan idolater. We may have assumed as much considering the region that this account is taking place, that this story is in, but Mark now confirms what we were already thinking, what we've already assumed. Yes, of course, she is a Gentile unbeliever. And this may not seem like a significant detail, just simply distinguishing that she is not Jewish, but it is. It's helping us recognize that this woman isn't a Jew who's living in the midst of Gentiles. She's not somebody who is living in the midst of unclean people who herself is still bound to the way of Moses, to the way of God. She's not one of the lost sheep of Israel who have been scattered throughout the land. She's a Gentile herself. She's a native of the land. A, as the text says, a Syrophoenician by birth. That's kind of like saying, Jesus has come to this region. He's come to the region of the GTA. He's come to the region of Toronto. And he meets somebody, he meets a woman who was Canadian by birth. Not somebody who's, who's immigrated in, or emigrated, I'm not sure which word I'm supposed to use. Not somebody who's moved in from the outside. This is somebody who, this is their home. This is their homeland. She doesn't just live here. These are her people. Their ways are her ways. This region defines who she is, both ethnically and religiously, how she acts, how she lives. But Mark is doing more than just simply describing her heritage. He's doing more than just describing where she came from. He's drawing our attention to her ethnic background because there's history involved. There's history we're supposed to think of. Jesus does this, does something similar in his parable of the Good Samaritan. You familiar with that parable? Parable of the Good Samaritan? 
Somebody asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells this parable of what it means to be a neighbor to somebody. And he tells this parable of this guy that gets beat up on the road and this priest walks by who is a Jew, just as the man who was beat up is a Jew. And this priest walks by and then doesn't help him. And then this Levite walks by, somebody who was uh, a part of not just the way of God, but who was actually employed in the service of the temple, of the tabernacle. And this holy and righteous guy who works for God he sees this man and passes by on the other side. And then who is the one that, that actually helps the beat up man? It's a Samaritan. And for us, we may go, great, I don't know anything about a Samaritan, what does that matter? We're meant to ask the question, why is this significant? Because Jesus tells this parable, highlighting the fact that the man who helped was a Samaritan, precisely because there was Jewish Samaritan relations, historically, that would have shocked the people who were listening. The Jewish people looked down upon the Samaritans, almost as, as half-breeds, people who had intermixed, interrelated with unholy people. And so they weren't true Jews. They were defiled, they were unclean people, both ethnically and religiously. They didn't worship the right way, they didn't think the right way, they weren't the right people, they weren't truly the people of God. Jesus wanted to shock his listeners because history is involved between these two people groups. Mark's doing the same thing here. He's drawing our attention to Jewish-Phoenician relationships. We're meant to ask the question, who are these people? Who were these people, these Syro-Phoenicians? The Phoenician people, particularly from the region of Tyre, where Jesus is now, were the wealthy, godless oppressors of the people of Israel. They were the the privileged, wealthy, sitting on their high horses, looking down their noses at Israel. They were the oppressors of the people of God. Listen to how the prophet Amos describes the sin of Tyre and Sidon. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because here's, here's their sin because they delivered up a whole people to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. These people of Tyre, the Phoenician people, had betrayed their covenant with Israel. There was a bond of brotherhood, a covenant that had been made in the time of King Solomon. We read of the king of Tyre sending lots of wood to Solomon, many beams to build the temple, to build his, his, uh, his palace. There was once a great, a great covenant that existed between the Phoenician people and the Jewish people, but they did not remember that covenant. They broke that covenant, and what did they do? They not only forsook the covenant, they had taken people who had once been their brothers, and they kidnapped them, they captured them, and they sold them as slaves. They became slave traders. They delivered up a whole people, that is the nation of Israel, they had kidnapped, and they had delivered them over to the hands of Edom. These are the kind of people that this woman comes from. What is Mark doing by highlighting the fact that this woman is a Syrophoenician? He's saying this woman's the enemy. Not only is this woman not one of us, she comes from the bad guys. She comes from the people that we hate because of what they did to us in the past. They are despised by the Jewish people for their backstabbing ways, but this woman doesn't allow history to get in the way of her coming to Jesus. She comes to him and begs, or rather, was begging continually. She kept on begging over and over and over again. She would not let go. She wouldn't take no for an answer. She kept pleading with Jesus to help her little girl. What will Jesus do with this unclean enemy's request? Will he ignore her cries for help as so many of his fellow Jews would have done in that day or will he grant her request? This leads us to the second stage of interaction, the response. And When we first look at Jesus' response to this woman, it appears as if Jesus wants nothing to do with the woman at all. His response seems crusty and insensitive overly harsh and heartless. 
it appears as if he's not only saying no, that part we think we get, it seems like Jesus is saying no pretty clearly, but it also seems like he's just throwing in an insult for good measure by calling her a dog. But is this true? Let the, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Is Jesus harshly rejecting and rudely insulting this woman? In the ancient world, as well as in many parts of the world today, dogs were not nice things that you kept around in your house. They were dirty, unclean, mangy, scavenging animals that ate litter and garbage. You didn't welcome them into your home, you kept them out. You used sticks to beat them away and you made sure that no dog was anywhere near you. They were nasty creatures, not the nice little house pets that we have today. It certainly doesn't sound like that's a very nice thing to call somebody a dog in Jesus' context. But Jesus doesn't use the generic, typical word for dog. He uses a word that specifically means little dog. We see this kind of phrase used actually earlier in our text when we're told that she has a little daughter in verse 25. There is daughter, and then there's a way of saying little daughter. There is dog, and there's a way of saying little dog. And Jesus has used that word, that phrase that means little dog. He's not referencing the generic filthy street animals that people kept away. He's referencing the kind of animal that actually might be kept as a house pet. Little dogs that were kept for company. Some of you may have these kind of little dogs, or you may have a big dog. I've got a big dog. He's not really one of these uh, nice house pets. He just knocks people over when you come in, but he is a house pet. Jesus is talking about the kind of dog that might actually be found in a house and by the dinner table where the crumbs might be found. It's not right to take the food, the bread, from the children and give it to the dogs. But this woman references this little dog that might actually be found under the table, picking up the crumbs that the kids drop. So his comment, Jesus' statement, isn't as initially insulting as we might think. It still doesn't sound very nice, but it's not quite as insulting as we may want to believe. We might rightly ask then, what in the world is Jesus doing? Okay, so it's not an insult, or it's not immediately as big of an insult as I thought, but but what is Jesus doing? What does this, this parable, this type of teaching, actually mean? What is he doing? Did Jesus just not get enough sleep? You know, he's looking for rest and restoration, relaxation, and he hasn't gotten it yet. Maybe Jesus, maybe Jesus you know, woke up on the wrong side of the bed this morning and he just kind of snapped at her. He just kind of lashed out at her. Why is Jesus so seemingly unnecessarily rude to her? Has he become overwhelmed by the attacks of the Pharisees? And has Jesus now taken what the Pharisees have been saying about not just Syrophoenicians, but about Gentiles in general? Has Jesus now adopted their position on what makes somebody defiled? Has he become just overburdened by their constant attacks and now he has is, he is, uh, assumed their way of thinking? Where is the compassion that Jesus had just a chapter before? We were told when Jesus fed the 5,000 men plus you know, however many thousands of women and children were there, we're told that Jesus looked at them and he had what on them? He had compassion. Where's the compassion here? It doesn't feel like Jesus is being all that nice towards her. Why is there no grace and kindness for this Gentile woman? Before we can answer these questions, we need to remind ourselves of what this woman is asking for. She has come to Jesus begging him on her knees to help her little daughter who is being tormented by an unclean spirit. Jesus, I need your help. She's asking for what? Healing. She's asking for her daughter to be restored restored to her right mind, restored to health, restored to being full and complete so that she's not split, being pulled away by this unclean spirit in mind and body. Jesus, make her whole again. Take what is broken and put it back together, please. She's looking for healing and restoration for her little girl. And we need to keep that in mind when we consider Jesus' response. Jesus says that just as bread is for children, Healing and restoration is for somebody specific as well. Just as bread belongs to children, healing and restoration belongs to who? It's for the people that God promised it to. 
It's for the God's chosen people. It's for the Israelites. That's what God said. You read through the prophets, and there's a lot of a lot of condemnation, a lot of judgment that comes, but then there's hope that's also preached. There will be restoration, there will be hope. There will be a time where you will be put together, not just as a people, but as individuals. You will be made whole again. God made that promise. Jesus points out that the promise was made to specific people. But is it only for them? Is it only for the Israelites? Didn't God tell Abraham that through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed? Yes, he did. And in God's sovereign grace, he has mercifully chosen to include people who are not ethnically Jewish. People like you and me. People just like this this Gentile woman. This is where we see that what Jesus is saying, he's not actually saying no, as we may initially think. We just need to remember what God has said in the past and pay close attention to what Jesus is saying here. He says that just as there is an order at the dinner table, children eat first, then the dogs, so too is there an order of restoration, Jews first, then the Gentiles. Paul will pick up in this in Romans chapter one, to the Jew first and then the Greek to the Jew first and then the Gentile. There is salvation, there is restoration, but it comes to the people of God first and then it is spread. We see that in the book of Acts, don't we? Where it came first to the the Jewish believers, the Jewish church in Jerusalem. It went first to the apostles and then from the apostles it spread everywhere to include people of every tribe, language, people, and nation. Jesus is not abusively insulting this woman. He's telling this woman that she has no right to cut the line. Did you ever do that in school? Somebody tried to cut the line in front of you and you say, hey, hey no butsies or no cutsies or no, I don't know, something like that. You, you, you can't do that. Get to the back of the line. We've been, we, we were here first. What, we're standing in line and because we're in line, that means we, we're owed whatever is promised at the end of the line, whether it be goodies or candy or cake or whatever it is. It's owed to us first, you can't butt in line. Jesus is saying that she has no special entitlement. She has no claim on what she's asking for. He's telling her that she has no right to ask for mercy. It isn't owed to her. Just like the bread at the table isn't owed to the dog under the table, you're not owed this. You have no right to ask for the thing that you're asking for. Jesus tells us something, communicates something here that we sometimes have a hard time grasping. And I think it's difficult to understand because we have this idea in our minds that everybody deserves help. And this is true in some sense, isn't it? Do you agree that everyone deserves help? We rightly believe that the dignity and worth of our fellow human beings created in the image of God obligates us to help when we can. We don't pick and choose on the basis of who we like, how they're dressed, what they sound like. We don't, we should not distinguish that way. James has some harsh words about distinguishing between people in his letter to the church. Don't welcome the wealthy and rich person and say, here's the, Here's the nice place in the church and to the poor and the ragged, you sit over here or you sit down at my feet. We don't pick and choose that way. Everybody as human beings has dignity and worth and we treat everybody equally and we care for one another when we can help. And that's a good thing. But that's a horizontal relationship. That's how we treat one another. That's how we interact with one another. And the horizontal relationship that we have with one another is not the exact same relationship that we have vertically with God. It's not a one-to-one relationship. How we relate to one another is not the same as how we relate to God. And here's the hard truth that Jesus tells not only this woman, but everybody who has ears to hear. Here's what he says, you don't deserve help. You don't deserve mercy. You don't deserve grace and compassion. God owes you nothing. As much as you need this, he doesn't owe it to you. You have no card that you can play that says, God, you have to give me this. There's no coupon you can hand in for that that says, I'm owed this. You have no right to ask for the thing that you're asking for. 
And this leads us to the third stage of the interaction here. Her reaction. The reaction that this woman has to Jesus' response to her request. Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Her reaction is shocking. Genuinely astounding if we've been paying attention. Do you know why? Because out of all of the people that Jesus has been talking with, out of all of the communication and dialogue Jesus has had with people, for all of the parables, for all of the teaching, for everything that Jesus has said, this woman is the only one we're told actually gets it on the first go. She actually understands what Jesus is saying. She understands Jesus' parable. This pagan Gentile woman is the first we've seen to comprehend the truth behind Jesus' parable. The crowds haven't understood. The Pharisees cannot discern. The disciples are even puzzled over and over and over again and have to ask Jesus, what did you mean? We don't understand. And they get rebuked for it. But this woman understands. She answers within the boundaries of the parable itself. She uses the phrases, the words that Jesus uses. She responds with the language in kind. She's not offended by Jesus' statement. She will even use the same word, that word that Jesus uses, little dog. She will use that to describe herself. She takes that on herself. She says, Jesus, I understand. I will take that role and I will respond with what you have said. She says, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I understand. And I agree. I know what you're saying. She recognizes exactly what Jesus is saying in his statement, and she acknowledges that God owes her nothing. She accepts the fact that she cannot demand grace from God, but she's persistent. She knows she doesn't have the privileges of the children at the table. She understands that restoration isn't owed to her. She recognizes that she has no claim on mercy. She acknowledges what is true of her, that she has no right to the goodness, kindness, and compassion of God. She has no claim on the bread, but she asks all the same. She asks for a crumb. Jesus, isn't there anything you can do? Something. Kids drop crumbs all the time, Lord. And the dogs even get to eat the crumbs that fall off the table. Isn't there something that could fall off of your table? Isn't there anything that you could drop for me? I'll take even a crumb. This woman will take whatever she can get. She'd rather have a crumb from Christ than a feast from any other false hope that the world has to offer. I'd rather have a little bit from God than anything that this world has to offer. Do we, do we value the things of Christ like this woman does? Do we truly believe that a little from Christ is better than the treasures of this world? Psalm 84, verse 10, you may recognize these words. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of of wickedness. This woman understands and holds on to what we often profess with our mouths but deny in our hearts when we lust after the things of the world. We say that yes, we believe that just a little bit from God is better than anything this world has to offer and then what do we do? We turn from the things of God and we go after the things of this world. And what will Jesus say now? What will Jesus say to the reaction of this woman who says, Lord, I understand I'm owed nothing, but Lord, please, I still beg of you, give me something. This leads us to the fourth and final stage of their interaction, the relief. Jesus grants her request for restoration. He brings relief to this little girl by freeing her from the torment of the demon. The text says in verse 29 that Jesus grants her request for this statement. 
For this statement, you may go on your way. For your reaction, for what you've said, you may go on your way. Matthew's gospel account in Matthew 15 tells us that it was because of her response of faith. It's not just the words that came out of her mouth, it was the heart that she spoke it from, that she spoke it in faith. And that's what led Jesus to free this little girl from demonic oppression. Which may lead us to think that perhaps Jesus has changed his mind. It appears as if Jesus says no. He hears a rebuttal from this woman. He hears her reaction and then decides on the basis of her reaction to give her what she asks for, to grant her request. Is this what happened? Did Jesus change his mind? Did she change Jesus' mind? Did she convince Jesus that his initial response was far too harsh, far too mean, far too demeaning, and that he should be a little bit more compassionate? Did she prove to him, did she prove to Jesus that she was actually worthy of the thing that she was asking for, that she was worthy of the request that she brought to Jesus? I don't think so. Because Jesus' statement wasn't designed by Jesus to push her away. It wasn't designed to be a barrier. It wasn't designed to be a a block. It was designed to show her the truth, the reality of who she was. It wasn't intended to offend. It wasn't intended to to crush her hopes of finding restoration. There will be restoration. It's even there in Jesus' statement. The purpose of Jesus' statement was to show her that she had no right to ask for the grace that she needed. That was his whole point. She has no right to claim mercy from God. Jesus was telling her that she doesn't deserve what she's asking for, and what is her response to all of that? She agreed. She recognized what God said about her, what Jesus was saying about her. She knows that she doesn't deserve it. And her attitude isn't one of demanding. God, you owe me this. I asked, and I asked nicely. I even got down on my hands and knees, and I begged. Now give me what I asked for. She doesn't do that. It's a response of humility. I know I don't deserve this, but only you can supply what I need. I have nowhere else to go. I have nobody else to ask. I know I don't deserve it, but I'm going to ask all the same. Jesus doesn't grant her request because she's proven herself worthy. Jesus grants her request because she's acknowledged that she isn't worthy at all because she's humbly accepted what Christ has said about her, you deserve nothing. Because she's come in humble dependence on the only one who can save. That's why she's given what she's asked for. Now the question is, for you and for me, is how will we respond? Not how, how would we respond, that's perhaps a good question to ask too, how would we respond if we were in her shoes? I'm not asking that question. The question is how will you respond now? Today, how will we respond to Jesus' statement, to this truth that God doesn't owe us grace and compassion? Because that's being told from the Bible. The, The pages of scripture scream that at us. God owes you nothing. Will we respond like this woman with humble acknowledgement of the truth? Or will we respond with with indignation and anger and resentment because we think that God owes us something? Because what is true of her in this text is true of us. We're all actually in her shoes. This woman was a pagan, idolatrous enemy of God, enemy of God's people. She did not choose her people, but she chose to live in their sinful ways. Do we rightly understand who we are before God? Do we recognize what the Bible rightly describes us as, enemies of God? Paul will say in Romans, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We're called things that are far worse than a Syrophoenician dog in the scriptures, aren't we? We're called wretched, foolish, and unclean. We're called worms, outcasts, rebels against the king. We're called self-centered, self-worshipping, idolatrous sinners, transgressors of God's law. Are you offended by that? Are you offended by what the Bible has to say about you? 
about who you are. The Bible tells us that we are not nice people. The Bible tells you that you're not a good person, that you're not a righteous and holy person deserving of going to heaven. That's what the Bible says. You're a sinner who stands justly condemned before a holy God. Can you acknowledge that? Can you understand that? Can you see what this woman sees, that she deserves nothing from God? She's actually owed, and we are owed, the opposite of grace and compassion. What does God owe us as sinners rightly condemned under his holy judgment? What what do we deserve? Death and condemnation. That's what you're owed. That's what's at the end of the line that you stand in. That's what you should rightly have, death and condemnation. In a few moments, we will be witnessing the the baptism of a few individuals. We will hear a brief testimony from both of them describing how they came to faith in Jesus. Testimonies are like fingerprints. They're all different, they're all unique. None are quite the same. And the testimonies we will hear are not going to be the same as ones that we've heard before. They're not gonna be the same as our own testimonies. And although each testimony is unique, every testimony has something in common. Every Christian testimony shares something with others, aside from the saving grace of God. Every true believer has accepted what the Bible has to say about them. That they are sinners who stand condemned in the hands of a just and holy God. You can't be a Christian without recognizing that. You can't be a believer in Jesus Christ without recognizing what the Bible has to say about you, without admitting what is true, otherwise you'll never see your need of the Savior. This is what causes so many people to stumble over the message of the gospel. People love the idea of grace and compassion, don't they? Everybody loves talking about love, right? Oh yeah, lots of love, lots of compassion, lots of grace, we'll we'll just build up on all the love and compassion stuff, but people are unwilling to admit that they actually need it. They want it, but they don't admit that they need it. We justify ourselves, we don't think we're all that bad, and we actually begin to think we're worthy of a little heavenly blessing, that God owes it to us. But we must acknowledge that we are not worthy, that God owes us nothing. We must allow ourselves to sit in that place of hopelessness and despair For it is only once we've accepted this truth that we are owed nothing from God but death and judgment. It's only once we've accepted that and see that and recognize that that the glory of the cross will actually shine through. It's only once we understand who we are and what we deserve will the cross actually begin to become a glorious, wondrous thing that we want to hold on to. We have no right to claim salvation. The son did not owe us his sacrificial death on the cross. We're not worthy of Jesus' atoning death, but God freely gives it to those who come to him in humility. Those who come in repentance and faith. Those who say, yes, God, I know I don't deserve it. I know I have no right to claim anything that you have, any of your goodness, any of your righteousness, any of your mercy. I have no right, but I have nowhere else to go. And what is the promise of God? Those who come acknowledging who they are and who Christ is and who come in humble dependence and faith and ask for which only he can give, he gives it freely. Let's pray. Father, I'm I'm reminded the words of a hymn that was written a long time ago. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked, I come to thee for dress. Helpless, I look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Lord, this is our prayer. We recognize we deserve nothing good from you. And we give you all the praise and the glory for all of the goodness, for every spiritual blessing that comes to us in Jesus Christ. We honor his name today. 
And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing a hymn and then we will witness the baptisms. Of Jesus and will obey his commands. Please join us as we sing, Are You Washed in the Blood? This is hymn number 308 if you want to follow along. <laughs> 